Before we begin our discussion, I've asked each of our panelists to read a short passage from their current work. And I think that we'll begin alphabetically and begin with uh, Phil. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for being here. This, cool. uh, this is uh, just a short bit from a story called War Stories. Seemed appropriate for tonight. Um, <clears throat> and it's uh, there's, uh, two veterans just talking. Uh, Jesse taps her cigarette and a dusting of ash floats down to the ground. My dad was in Vietnam, she says. My granddad, Korea. But when my dad went in, he didn't think of the guys stuck in the frozen chosen after that asshole MacArthur thought it'd be a good idea to go rogue and poke China with a stick. My dad thought flag raising at Iwo Jima, D-Day and Audie Murphy. And when I went in, platoon in full metal jacket. Yeah, definitely not my dad in an admin shop. I bet more Marines have joined the Corps because of Full Metal Jacket than because of any fucking recruiting commercial. And that's an anti-war film. Nothing's an anti-war film, I say. There's no such thing. Growing up, Jesse says, Sarah spent a lot of time at our house and she sp still sp spends some holidays with us. Her family's a mess. And last Thanksgiving we were talking with my grandpa about how nobody remembers Korea. And he said the only way to do it right wasn't to make a film about the war. Do a film about a kid growing up about the girl he falls in love with and breaks his heart and how he joins the army after World War II. Then he starts a family and his first kid is born and it teaches him what it means to value life and to have something to live for and how to care for other people. And then Korea happens and he's sent over there and he's excited and scared and he wonders if he'll be courageous and he's kinda proud and then in the last 60 seconds of the film they put them in boats to go to Incheon and he's shot in the water and drowns in three feet of surf and the movie doesn't even give him a close up, it just ends. That'd be a war film. Thank you. Nadipa? Hi, everyone. I'll be reading from my second novel, The Orchard of Lost Souls, which is set in Somalia in the 1980s. Apart from, oh, sorry. Apart from sporadic gunfire and the faraway bat rattle of trucks crossing Hedgesa Bridge, it appears as if the soldiers and rebels have exhausted each other. The first orgy of violence has been enacted. Now it is time for bodies to be buried, wounds to be attended to, sleep to be caught up on. The moonlight is so bright that Kausa can see to the end of the street, where short, velvety shadows huddle beneath them like gins. The tanks, the planes, helicopters, armored vehicles and cannons have been put to bed, and the few songbirds that haven't fled begin to trill calling out disorientated, despondent songs to one another for comfort. They move slowly, as if through water, Filson pushing with her whole body and stumbling repeatedly. Kausa huddles under the blanket and tries to piece together the broken shards of the shattered neighborhood into something she recognizes. Rage's tidy little shop has been ransacked. Mariam's goat Goat, Mariam's goat, pants half dead on its side. Umar Fare's hotel has received an intense barrage of mortars, its green windows mostly splintered and blackened. The cassettes from the video hall have been smashed and tape flutters in the trees like mourning banners. A, fo a fire smolders on Fadumo's roof. Dega pulls the wheelbarrow to the left, away from the three bodies lying on their stomachs. Kausa puts her hand to her eyes to avoid the sight, but feels drawn to look, recognizing Mariam and her children from the gaps between her fingers. Neither Dergo nor Filson look in the direction. Kausa says a prayer for the family, a shame that she cannot even bury them. Mariam, with her alligator bag full of medicines, deserved more than this country had given her and her children. It has now reduced them to hide and meat, for the vultures to pick over. Thank you. Roxana? So I'll read from the opening of my novel, Sparta, in which um, the main character, Conrad Farrell, is landing in America. He's making his first landfall after his final de deployment from Iraq, in Iraq. 
The airport runways and buildings stretched out below them, straight axial lines like a mechanical drawing. The plane dropped rapidly, and the long, flat buildings, the dark tarmac, rose up alarmingly to meet it. The engines became louder, the pitch ascending toward some unbearable climax. The plane fell sickeningly toward the earth. There was a pounding inside his skull. He could feel it coming, the moment in which you heard the sound. It was before anything had hit, when the air was full of ozone, the moment in which you understood that something was happening but not yet what. It was the moment that you knew in your body before you knew it in your mind, the moment when you felt the sound like a great silence taking you over, the shock wave rolling through your body, your heart, your lungs, time stopping around you, everything flying apart into fragments, that limitless, radiant moment glittering behind your eyelids before you knew. He was frozen and still, his muscles clenched, his palms were sweating. Inside, he was huge and cavernous, and his heart was doing something monstrous and unnatural. Tears horribly brimmed at his eyelids. Some avalanche was poised, ready to break loose. He couldn't stop it. Something was running riot through him, some cloudburst of panic and confusion, noise and smoke and terror. He was consumed by fear. It was sweeping through him as though he'd been overtaken by fire, as though he were now rippling and radiant with flames. Somewhere, he was screaming. Terror was blowing him apart. Thank you. Joanna? Hello. So as I'm here as a critic and a reader of war literature rather than a writer, um, I thought I would share a couple of ways that influential war writers have tried to shape and control how their work is read. The English war poet Wilfred Owen was killed a week before the 1918 armistice. Earlier that year, he wrote the first draft of a preface to a planned volume of his collected poetry that contains at its center three memorable, if slightly mystifying, lines. Above all, he wrote, I'm not concerned with poetry. My subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. Since Owen wrote those lines, they've had a huge effect, I think, on how war literature is read and understood. They make sure that the literariness of war literature is absorbed by the warness and subordinated to it, that the subject uh, overwhelms the form. And in response, readers are asked to pity rather than analyze or criticize or really engage with um, what is being told. Pity is a kind of distance. It keeps a subject at arm's length. The other idea that Owen emphasized in his preface was that there was greater truth in the spirit rather than the letter of what he wrote. That's why he says he doesn't use proper names. Many of the most famous World War I prose narratives by veterans that appeared about 10 years after the end of the war were also writing in that spirit and were some hybrid form of fiction and autobiography. Um, Eric Mur Maria Remark, the author of All Quiet on the Western Front, told the New York Times in 1929 that, um, for obvious reasons, I adopted the fiction form, but what I put down was the truth. And so, but he's also concerned with how his work is going to be read. And in his dedication to that novel, he writes, this book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all an adventure, for death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by war. So he's also trying to define and limit the possible interpretations of the story, and he's rejecting this very old literary heritage of the combat narrative, uh, war as adventure, and closing that down. Owen, in the same way, rejects ideas of glory and heroism and all of the great sort of the, the Western classical narratives of war that his generation has been raised with. So Remark and Owen both try to define war literature as something separate from literature, but at the same time, they insist that their writing contains a more important truth 
than what can be conveyed if they were writing factually accurate documentary accounts. So they subordinate the values of history to the values of literature. And ever since, I think, we've expected poets and novelists to tell some kind of truth of war that is more powerful and profound than journalists and historians. But can we do any more with that truth than pity? Thank you. Thank you all for those vivid and insightful introductions to the subject at hand. I think I'm going to pick up that uh, from your overview, Joanna. There's a much quoted expression about the first casualty of war being truth. And uh, Remark is, is asserting there that maybe fiction writers uh, are somehow exempt from that. But I'd like to ask each of you, uh, is, is fiction, is literature also among the casualties of war when it comes to truth? Anyone? Would Phil, you, you look. Oh. I'd like to hear from all of you, to be sure. <laughs> I think there's plenty of BS about every subject in, in human experience, and war is just one of them, right? Um, I was, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, that's certainly a tendency in war writing, right? And, and the notion that you can't even really convey what's happened. Um, uh, and you're just supposed to sort of have it view these, you know, objects of suffering. I think um, Randall Jarrell's poetry, was it, um, uh, did Dickey refer to them as killable puppets, right? Um, Jarrell's poetry, they're, they're uh, you know, the airmen are always described in, in these very passive forms. I have a friend who's a literary critic who talks about this, and they're described as children very frequently. You know, the ball turret gunner from my mother's womb, I fell into the state, and, and, and many others. One of, one of his poems is a lullaby addressed to the airmen. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a huge problem, right, which is what you, what you bring up, that you, <laughs> it sections off the experience from other types, other categories of human experience. Um, and it privileges a certain kind of direct, unmediated, you know, relationship to war in the abstract. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, the early American theologian, um, Jonathan Edwards, uh, has a great, wrote Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, is, uh, wrote a great uh, piece on the nature of true virtue. And he excludes pity from being of the nature of true virtue because he says, you know, pity isn't, isn't concerned with the, the totality, right? Somebody in their totality just is interested in the suffering. Uh, and he writes, you know, men may, pity those in extreme distress when yet they would have been grieved to see them prosper, right? It's a very comfortable way for us to engage with experience through pity, uh, and it doesn't deal with both the complexity of that experience and also our relationship to it. Yeah, so. I'd agree with that. I think there's something slightly sinister about pity, and it does um, reduce people. I, one of the things that I kept wanting to do, actually, was you see those faces on adverts for charities and in emergencies and things and it's someone caught in a moment, you know, a second where that photograph was taken and that photograph is meant to tell their whole story when of course it can't and what I really wanted to do was keep investigating, well, who was that guy, who's that older man who's um, crying in a refugee camp, what's his story? Um, but you can't and you end up, um, it's, it's a hard temptation to avoid actually the, um, because you're also feeling pity, you're also feeling sympathy and empathy, but what you really want to do is actually think of yourself in that situation and say, well, I missed the Civil War by just two years. If I'd stayed, I would have been in one of those adverts probably, mm -hmm. and um, my story is much bigger than that. So I try to actually think of it in a very matter-of-fact way. There was a dictatorship, it was crumbling, and at some point it turned into a full-out conflict. Um, so I wonder, when Joanna said that, I wonder how he was using the word pity. It seems awfully facile if he's simply saying, we should all pity the wounded, we should all pity the people who are caught up in this, because that's a, that's a very simplistic response. And I wondered if he was saying, um, wh what was the phrase exactly? It, it's, it's pity that we, it's a... It's like a sort of series of in things that are folded into each other. The, the, um, the subject is war and the pity of war, and then the poetry is in the pity. 
it just so it's like when, an oddly things are right. inside each other when, when you read that i wondered if he meant it, it's it's a pity that it happens instead of mm -hmm. feel pity for these people which i agree is kind of a condescending um, emotion and and sentimental uh, which is the worst kind of emotion, which is emotion without responsibility. So pity is, is the, di to, diminishes the person. But um, the larger question about whether fiction, war fiction can tell a truth, I mean, I think, I agree with Phil, there's, you know, there's good fiction and bad fiction, there's fiction that doesn't tell anything. But w war is, is a really, such a complicated subject in that um, I, I think alone of human endeavors, it, it contains both inhuman and human behavior. And so it's paradoxical. And, it's, and no one can actually um, comprehend all of that. There is no one truth to tell about war. So what the greatest war fiction is doing is trying to give some sense of complexity and the, and the hugely divergent emotions that um, emerge from war. But there is there's no one truth, because it's it's um, experience that goes in both directions. You're human, and you're trying to kill other humans. And that's, that sets up a series of um, confusions inside the soul that are really impossible to, um, to turn into one coherent moment, I think. Well, I was thinking in terms of, from the point of view, as, as, as you touch on, each of you as, as authors, is there a particular urgency or a mandate to find that truth? I mean, I suppose that Updike might have felt that urgency to find the truth in adultery, for instance, or in depiction of married life. But it seems that, as you say, war, war is this rather epic subject that touches so many people in an epic way and individuals so dramatically. And I wonder also, in terms of nesting questions within other questions, if there isn't something inherently political about addressing war. So, but I would just say that, to repeat this question, did any of you feel a particular urgency in terms of your representation to, to keep a fidelity to what you believed was true because it was this particular subject as opposed to writing about one's college roommate? Yeah, I'd say I felt an urgency. Um, the Somali civil war is still ongoing in mm -hmm. parts of the country, and very little has been written about it, particularly by Somalis, whether fiction or non-fiction. So it's still pretty much a blank slate when it comes to writing. And when there is attention given to it, especially from the West, actually, it's completely dis uh, distorted. So people think that the war began in Mogadishu in the early 90s, and it was between... General Aidid Farah and the other guy and then the US Marines went in and different things happened. But the war had been going on for three years already at that, by that stage. And it started in the north, which was um, an area that the government had suppressed for many years by that stage. And eventually they, they did what, what Bashar, um, Bashar Assad is doing in Syria now and bombed the hell out of the, the city that I'm from and really just wanted to flatten it and get the population to, to move to Ethiopia. So knowing that people that I care about, my family, were involved in this war and yet it's still so misunderstood gave the writing an urgency for me. Absolutely. Um, you know, I wrote my book kind of in a the sort of low-grade terror going on all the time. Um, you know, I'm writing about, when I started writing, uh, it was about a war that we were still engaged, engaged in as a nation. Um, and of course, the violence is continuing for Iraqis um, right now. But I think that the notions that we have about war um, are tremendously important. I mean, they, they, the way that we think about war and the way that we think about veterans, that that informs all the interactions that you have with veterans when they come home. And it also informs the decisions that we make as, as citizens, right? Um, you know, we live in a democracy, ultimately. Uh, we are the ones responsible for the wars that we've engaged in. Uh, and yet, um, there's not much engagement with the wars. And there's a lot of really terrible notions and, and narratives 
in, in society are just false narratives about war and what it means um, and what it means to come home. And those play themselves out personally, they play themselves out politically. And I think that, um, you know, ultimately uh, it's, it's our responsibility when we think about policy to think about what that means on a human level. Uh, and so that's sort of, this, you know, part of what I was trying to do. And of course I wrote with the perpetual sense that, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd write a story and then a million veterans would beat me up for getting it wrong, which is good, which is healthy. Well, that's, that's an ob a sense of an obligation to a certain kind of shared truth, right? Well, um, you know, the, the obligation is, is to, is not to tell the thing that, that would make everybody happy, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, you, you respect someone's experience, you respect them as a person by dealing with them honestly, right? You know, you don't patronize them and pretend their experience was something greater than it was, nor do you, you know, nor do you demonize them. Um, or just assume that they're broken, pitiable objects. Okay. I think I'm going to take a, a, a bit of the, a quote from the piece that you read, and I'm going to address a question to Joanna because of her breadth of knowledge about, uh, about war literature. Uh, you have this exchange where someone says, there's no such thing as an anti-war film. And at least what the idea that I take away from that is there was something inherently compelling about any or any narrative that is inherently compelling offers us a protagonist that is compelling and therefore attractive. And if that protagonist is a warrior, it makes war somewhat attractive. And maybe you could begin meditating on that, and I'd like to hear from all of you, but maybe you can bring some historical perspective to that. We start with Achilles, right? And work our way up to Clint Eastwood. Sure, and actually I was really struck by that line as well, and I wanted to, uh, to pick up on it. Um, and it's true, the, uh, um, when I was talking about um, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, that's one of the books that launched what was known in the UK as the war books boom, or the war books controversy, depending on who you asked, which was when uh, writers like Robert Graves and Siegfried Sassoon published their lightly or heavily fictionalized memoirs. Um, and a lot of these books were, were denounced in by fairly conservative, politically conservative uh, reviewers as being anti-war and that there was something, um, because they were nihilistic and they focused on the individual experience and claimed that the individual experience was universal and they didn't look at war as a as a large sweeping epic thing, but as a personal tragedy and a personal trauma that the individual was bearing witness to. And I think that, that the idea that the, uh, the story is anti-war if it is individual and sort of pro-war if it is broad may have been something that uh, was a sort of division that, that became kind of accepted. Um, but I'd agree that the assumption then that we have such a thing as anti-war literature is, is curious because it's something that goes so deeply into an individual psychology of a narrator who you come to, um, you know, who you, who you come to trust and to, and, and to, to follow through their story. Um, and that story exists because of the war that they fought and, the, and what they went through. It's hard to then say that, that, that that's anti-war because it wouldn't exist as a story without the war. Exactly. So, there's a, so there is that, I think that paradox has always been there in terms of how war literature is read. Roxana? Wait, what's the question? <laughs> the question is, <laughs> Where have we gotten now? Is, is there such a thing as, as, oh, an anti as anti war literature? Um, is literature by its very nature? Yeah. It's good. Compelling. I mean, the Iliad is is the one that we look at the most, and and the Iliad has wide, wild swings in it, and and the descriptions of violence in that poem are so powerful and so heinous, really. I mean, the description of the the point of the spear, where it enters the body and where it leaves the body, and how 
the, the dark is pulled down over the eyes of the falling soldier and how his parents in a leafy um, arbor will never hear the footsteps coming up again of the, on the path of their son. So he, he pulls you back and forth between the glory of battle and the desperate um, horror of it in a way that doesn't happen in All Quiet on the Western Front, which is one of my favorite war books. And also, when I was interviewing vets, um, I asked each vet what his favorite war book was. And that was by far the, the favorite. And it's, um, I think it's also sold in the bookstore at Quantico, isn't it, Phil? I, I sure know it is. Um, the Peloponnesian Wars is, the history of the Peloponnesian Wars is sold at Quantico. So there is this sort of um, shift back and forth. I think people who are involved in war want to read um, stories about it. And I remember in Jarhead, Anthony Swafford saying the same thing, he, that they all watched war movies the night before they were deployed. And there is no such thing as an anti-war movie. Movies also tend to um, reach into you in a way that is more visceral than, than what literature can do. And I think there's an emotional surge that happens in a, in a war movie that, yeah, I think there is no such thing as an anti-war movie. I mean, I've never seen one. But I think All Quiet on the Western Front is pretty seriously anti-war. I think it really does deliver that message that this is a terrible endeavor, and no one who's involved in it would have started it, and the people who started it are not involved in it. Some thoughts, Nadipa? <laughs> Just a silly one. But I was thinking of an, um, an anti-war film, and the closest I could get is actually Avatar. <laughs> Where, you know, you're definitely on the side of the people who are being invaded, and you see the aggression for what it is, and I think that's the closest I've seen Hollywood get to an anti-war film. Um, I would... Perhaps not to a 14-year-old boy who wants to be the person who's shooting the missiles or mm. the avenging Riding attacker. Riding those animals. Perhaps, but I, I'm so anti-war that I probably, I can't see the attraction in it. Mm. I don't understand it. So for me, every film is anti-war. I watch Apocalypse Now and I, I'm on this, you know, I, I see myself as the victim of it, not as the person mm. actually perpetrating the violence. So you wrote that passage, Phil. What, what were you thinking about? Well. First off, Marines do love Full Metal Jacket um, and Apocalypse Now. Um, I think, well, for one thing, this, this it goes back to what we started with, which is, you know, if if war is this sort of outside of of, of even literature, you know, war literature is, is kind of a set outside of everything else because it's dealing with this subject where you can just kind of come back and testify to what you've seen. There's a sort of privileging of that experience, right? I mean, this is actually what Full Metal Jacket is about. It's about the Joker wants to have the thousand-yard stare, which is the sign that he's, you know, stared into the heart of darkness and and can't tell you what it was, but you know, he's he's reached that level of respect, and and um, and so you see that, and yeah, it's awful, but you wanna you wanna be that guy. I have, I have a friend who who wrote about he's you know like joining the military not because he wanted a future, but because he wanted a past. Um, yeah, no, another vet, Perry O'Brien. Um, there are films, there's a film called Come and See, which is about Belarusia in World War II. I don't think anybody's ever watched that movie and wanted to join the military, but uh, yeah, there's not a lot. Even the sort of tr what we think of as traditional anti-war fiction or, or anti-war literature, um, you know, the way that it's taken up, uh, it really depends on how you know, how we read it and what kind of things it's privileging. Actually, there's a film, um, a Chinese film called Devils on the Doorstep, which is about the Japanese invasion of China. And th that I would call an anti-war film. I think it's now banned in China for some reason. And it just makes war seem ridiculous. Everyone is ridiculous in it. The peasants, um, the Japanese soldiers, and everyone is running around. There's no order. There's just kind of empty brutality. And it doesn't end you know, with any kind of courage or um, triumph in anyone's part. I mean, there's certainly a series of American novels published in the wake of the Second World War by people like Erwin Shaw or James Jones that presented somewhat traditional heroes. And then we had Joseph Heller or Kurt Vonnegut publishing Slaughterhouse-Five and Catch-22 that attempted to satirize um, 
war. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how successfully. But that makes me think of this idea of, of you know, you bring up Wilfred Owen, and I, I immediately think of Paul Fussell's wonderful book, The Great War in Mo Modern Memory, in which he essentially argues that World War I pretty much put an end to certain notions about war, and particularly the idea of the heroic soldier. And I'm wondering how you see contemporary war literature, the, the, the books that you've written and the books that you're reading about uh, the current situation. Uh, how has that heroic soldier changed? Is that, is that kind of heroism still possible? Is, is Conrad in your novel uh, an heroic soldier? Or is that a mutation or a change, an evolution of a notion of heroism? Um, I mean, each war is different from every other war. So Iraq is different from all the other wars we've fought in. My character is not heroic, except insofar as he occupies the center of, of the narrative. Um, but I think it was, it was fairly hard to be a heroic figure in Iraq because, um, because of the nature of the war. It's, we didn't really have a reason for being there. We, what, there wasn't any concerted um, enemy that we could address the way we did in, in World War II. Um, it, it was a very confusing kind of uh, um, battle that we were in. Um, so the people there were often frightened. They were all, often helpless. They were all, often uh, set up in situations in which they, there was no good choice. There was no heroic way to act. So for me, that was, that was a big part of learning about Iraq was um, this lack of the heroic narrative. Um, and I think we're way past that. I really think All Quiet on the Western Front made a huge difference in the literature of war and the way we looked at it. And as you say, there were um, narratives that came out after World War II that, that continued in that trend. But we really don't see the warrior, civilians don't see the warrior as the hero the way we once did and the way he was once treated in literature. I think that's over, really. One thing I would say is that I think that if there's a value that continues, um, that, it's, that it's comradeship, that it's about, um, that heroism <coughs> in contemporary war narratives relies on the way that you treat your men and not, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a group, um, it's sort of not abandoning um, the group and those moments of heroism are about, um, are about your fellow soldiers. Um, but I actually think that's an older, idea as well. I mean, if you go back to the Iliad, again, I mean, Achilles is the great hero who spends nine-tenths, of you know, most of the book not fighting at all, and only is inspired to go back to the battle when his, um, when his, when his closest friend is killed. And there's a kind of a sense that we have a distorted idea, of, uh, the idea of the hero as a sort of a lone actor is is sort of n is definitely not mm -hmm. um, sort of a prevalent idea, but I also think it's it's never really been about acting in isolation. The, the Greek heroes who went off alone generally came to grief and and are not treated as as ultimately people to be emulated. I think yeah, I think that's right, and I think I think that the notions of heroism certainly do survive. I mean, um, you know, there's there's fiction, there's the fictional realm. Uh, then you've got like World War II, nostalgia, nonfiction, right? Um, but, you know, the thing about war and, and, and probably why just sort of pity is not on a pile on poor dead Wilfred Owen, but is not sufficient is, is it's a broader experience than that, like anything else, right? Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I knew, I knew people who were heroic. Uh, I mean, you can point to, God, there was a, a female uh, medic who was killed just, uh, just recently in Afghanistan uh, who risked her life trying to get to an injured soldier um, and was blown up in a minefield. Um, you know, uh, or, you know, I knew a Marine who had seen a friend of his uh, dying to save his life and the lives of his other Marines who chose to extend and go to Afghanistan because he knew that Afghanistan was where the fighting was and, and 
the the soldiers that um, sorry the Marines that he was he was he would be with he, you know he explained it to me that he knew what it was like to have lost one of your friends and then have to continue to go out and and do the mission and, and he figured that he would be able to to help them through what he anticipated would be a rough deployment um, and he was right uh, he died in 2009 so heroism absolutely continues. It just continues with, with a sort of notion that a lot of the old rhetoric is insufficient, right? But I mean, that was true during you know, Civil War literature, right? I mean, Ambrose Bierce is, is as dark as any modern. Mm -hmm. I think in a Somali context, probably the soldiers are not seen as the heroic ones. It was the rebels and they put their lives on a line on the line for for the for the rest of everyone and it's it's a narrative that i struggle with because um people like my grandmother were forced into the war it wasn't a, it wasn't a choice that she was able to make the the rebels were fighting the government and the government was fighting everyone so i'm not sure if i buy into it completely but yes they they sacrificed themselves in a very blunt way. They expected to be killed and they still tried to overthrow the government and in the end they did overthrow the government. But I didn't want to really celebrate them in my novel. I wanted to celebrate the people like my grandmother who um, showed small acts of heroism. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things about, about the three works of fiction that we're considering here is that in, in your novel you have focus on three women one of whom is a soldier, one is a nine-year-old girl, another is an older woman and a widow. So their role in war is not the traditional role of a combatant, except one of the women. Uh, in Sparta, we're talking about someone who has left the war, who's no longer a soldier. And, and, and Phil, and many of your stories take place in theater, as they say, but also many take place um, here in the States. Many take place with people who have left uh, the military. So I'm going to address this question first to Johanna and then to all of you to talk about your own works. But I know that you've written about the notion of homecoming uh, as a literary, from a literary historical point of view of the homecoming of the soldier. And maybe you could put something on the table for, a, for a, the novelist to touch on. I'm sure. I mean, I, again, you go, and go back to, to Homer and to um, the fact that homecoming is much more fun while you're in the, during the journey until, and then when you actually arrive, um, like Odysseus, the second half of the epic poem that is not really the part that anyone reads, which is about disguising yourself and humiliating yourself and trying to prove that your wife has been faithful and going, going to the underworld and meeting your, um, all of your fellow heroes who died in war and had heroic deaths who just or who sort of tell you about the terrible things that have happened since and the fact that it wasn't worth it after all. And so this, this sense that the, the homecoming, when it happens, is, um, is, is a letdown, is, is sort of, uh, you know, goes, goes right back. And I think that, I mean, that becomes a, uh, it becomes a very complicated question. And I think in contemporary writing, it's uh, a lot of it, a lot of the ways that it's written about and, and thought about is in terms of um, of gender and in intimate relationships between um, between the women who have been waiting and the men who are coming home, and this kind of classical paradigm between your patient Penelope and your betraying Clytemnestra who who has cheated on you and murders you in your bathtub. So there's you know those two extremes are sort of the way that um, that relationship has been structured, the, the homecoming is a reunion with a woman who you don't know whether or not you can trust. Um, and I know that comes through in, in your novel, and, it, yeah. uh, and some of the stories as well. Anyone else want to take that idea <laughs> up, of the, the idea of the non-combatants, the home front? Because it seems mm -hmm. that each of you have, have focused on that. It's. <laughs> Yeah, the um, there's, a, there's a feminist critic, and I'm forgetting her name, who's written about how sort of the traditional, you know, combat narrative kind of just excludes non-combatants. That that um, 
you know, the um, sort of like the Achebe criticism of, of Heart of Darkness that, you know, sort of where black suffering is just sort of the, the arena in which there's a sort of battle for the white soul that's going on, that, that that's what, you know, a certain type of war literature does. Um, uh, and uh, and the, the critic was arguing that there's sort of like a fem feminist canon that doesn't do that. Um, but the, the homecoming is, I think, particularly sort of strange, certainly in the current wars, because of, um, for the one thing, you have like the all-volunteer military, and you have the, the degree of kind of apathy and lack of interest among the wars, um, and the ways in which they're kind of going on on autopilot without many Americans paying attention. And so, uh, I, you know, I, re I remember coming back. Uh, I'd, I'd been in Iraq and I had a very mild deployment, but I got two weeks leave and I, you know, flew back into New York uh, and walked down Madison Avenue and, and, you know, just a couple days before I'd seen people coming in with just horrible injuries into this surgical center and, and, um, and walking like this, we're not at war, we're not at war. Um, and that's, that apathy is not unrelated to the political decisions that we make as a nation, right? Um, you know, uh, the reason that, that we started the, Nixon started the volunteer military was so that you wouldn't have the kind of uh, political scrutiny on a war, that he would have more freedom. Uh, and that has consequences on the battlefield. So thinking about the non-combatant back home, the, the, the soldier's relationship to them, that, that desire to create a certain diff distance and to privilege their own experience, which sort of privileges the veteran, but also kind of sections them off from society in, a, in kind of harmful ways. And then the way in which that same motive, you know, allows you to be blind to other experience and their relationship to war, um, which is something that we all do together. Um, you know, these are all our wars. Uh, I think is, is something that's really important to deal with in fiction. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking to vets and asking them questions and asking what their experiences had been, and and I was um, I was fascinated by this notion of the home homecoming, and it seemed, as since I'm a civilian, that I, I first thought of writing about um, my putting my character in Iraq for most of the book, and I, and I realized I couldn't do it. There wasn't there was too much information I wouldn't be able to get. So I said it um, here in America after he came back and. And uh, listening to people talk about it, um, it was very powerful to watch their faces and hear their voices as they struggled to express this notion of distance and isolation. And, and one of the vets I talked to um, is married, and his wife was in the room and as he was telling me about this. And I, I said, well, we sort of went through his deployment and coming home. And, and I said, and so, you know, did it, was it, difficult for you and he said yeah it, it was it was very difficult and I said well you want to tell me about what what parts were difficult and so he said well okay the most difficult time and he started talking about uh, his cousin's wedding and it was out in the country and it was a beautiful day and there was music and there was wine and everybody was happy and as he described this, his face became darker and darker. And he said, everyone was there. There was a big crowd. They were all singing. And they were, there was music. And it, it was as though he was describing a torture chamber. And I looked at his wife, and she was weeping, just tears streaming down her face. And it was such a striking image of this gigantic chasm between the man who'd come home to his family and friends and simply couldn't connect anywhere nearly at all with them. And they had no idea. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know he was suffering. He couldn't reach them. And it was, um, those are all things that we think define a great American experience. Music, lots of people, noise, um, joyfulness. And it was excruciating to him. He wanted to be alone. He wanted to be in a silent place. So um, for lots and lots of reasons, war is, is something that changes you, and you can't connect. Some of the vets coming home will never connect. Um, some of them will 
get through that and, and feel perfectly normal. But it's a huge passageway that exists. And um, I, I found it incredibly compelling and, and the place that, that for me was the most powerful in terms of the civilians and the vets. It's, it's back here at home where there's just, it just seemed as though there was no way for them to connect. Well, you have a different experience because you're writing about a civil war in which yes. there, that bifurcation of here and there doesn't quite exist, right? No, even in terms of location, actually, um, what you just said reminded me of um, the fact that in the early 90s there was a massive influx of Somalis into the UK, particularly London, and suddenly um, we had Somalis everywhere after feeling very cut off from our home country. And it was always, we never had any contact with soldiers or combatants, it was the it was the ordinary civilians that we spoke to about their experiences of war. So I never really think of soldiers when I think of war. I think of the people who suffer and um, are displaced. And it comes out in strange ways. I remember hearing that um, there was a police helicopter flying over a school, and the school had a large population of Somali children, and they went mad. It must have brought back kind of memories of uh, Mogadishu and the cobras and things like that, and they just went crazy for the afternoon and uh, I, I didn't see that at my school but these, these memories, these experiences pop out, they emerge from people and you're suddenly reminded of what they experienced. Could you talk a little bit about your character, my pronunciation, Filson, yeah. uh, female soldier. Um, what drew you to that character and did you have to do research? Was this based on someone? that you know? No, actually, she isn't, but um, she came, she was the character that really came to the novel at the end. I, there was something missing, just writing about the experiences of people who were victims of the war. I wanted, there were women who were perpetrators of violence and there have been since, you know, I remember the pictures from Abu Ghraib and also reading about accounts from the civil wars in Ethiopia and Sudan that women were active participants in the violence. So I wanted to look at that. I wanted to examine that more closely. And Filson is someone who has benefited from the dictatorship. They attempted to liberate women and give them an equal status to men. But it was half-hearted, and she ends up being someone who doesn't fit into any kind of world. And her, her violence is partly ideological and partly just a, an, out, an outlet for frustration. And what kind of research did you do to find out about her experience? I, I, I spoke to people who were on the other side, so rebels, about their experiences of female combatants, um, for books, historical research, libraries. Okay. Um, Roxanne, I, I'm going to just read a little passage that intrigued me from your novel. Uh, it's. Uh, you're characterizing your, your protagonist Conrad's discontent, and I think it's in a scene with his, with his girlfriend. Um, but uh, the quote goes like this. He missed his men and missed something more. It was like a dark crack, a crevice, a sliver, reaching down inside of him, deep and narrow. There was something he needed from there, something he didn't have here. Now, that uh, aside from the prose there being really beautiful. Uh, that got me thinking uh, about what's being described there. And, and it, I think it's safe to say that we all experience a, a kind of existential longing that seems to be characterized there. And I would ask you, what is, what is different about Conrad's void uh, given his experience in the war? You mean from? His, vo his void and our his, void. His and, void uh, and, and someone who hasn't been through those experiences. Well, or maybe it's not different. I don't know. One, uh, one of the things that struck me about the vets was a sense of kind of woundedness at the civilian's response. It was, it was, um, it was humble, but it was a sense of aggrievement. It was sort of, you know, I was over there. And I was going through all this, and I didn't mind it. I didn't mind risking my life. I didn't watch, mind watching my buddies. I'd be, you guys, what? You, you just aren't even paying attention? You're not, it's not that I want you to 
cheer every time I walk in the room, but really you don't even know that we're at war and you don't care what I did. So, so there was this sense of, of um, sense of kind of emptiness that I got from them at being here. And when they were over there, there were lots of things that were horrible, but, but there was a sense of incredible purpose. They always had a mission, whether it was a stupid mission or not. There was a mission, there was a sense of purpose. And since it's a volunteer army, I mean military, a lot of people went into it for reasons of idealism. They wanted a challenge, they wanted to make the world a better place. So they went in for reasons that most civilians aren't, for, they made decisions that most civilians are not making. So they, they went through philosophical um, pat, you know, series of questions and they said, this is what I want to do. I know I will risk my life, but I'm willing to do that. And I, so they go over there and they have whatever experience they have. And they come back and there's nothing here. So it was, it was that sense of lack, of lack of engagement, lack of purpose, lack of urgency, um, there's just a feeling that I got from them that over there, when things were bad, it was a, there was a sense of tremendous, there was a heightened sense of being alive and a sense of purpose, and here there was nothing. So that's what I was talking about. Interesting. Uh, Bill, in, in, in one of your stories, you, a group of Marines visit a strip club, and they're, they're looking looking for love, I suppose. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a rather blunt depiction of these encounters. And it, they seem shot through with, on the part of the soldiers, uh, loneliness and anger and sadness. What about the emotional lives of these Marines? Were you trying to get on the page? I mean, was it something connected to what Roxanne is talking about here? Well, I mean, certainly that's, that's very, I mean, <clears throat> you know, there is a huge sense of purpose, right? I mean, it's unavoidable. You can't, you know, you can't be like, well, it doesn't really matter if I don't do a good job on patrol. Like, you might, you might get somebody killed. Um, uh, you know, y your job clearly matters. You're surrounded by a group of people uh, for whom your job matters. I mean, even if you're in a, in a uh, support staff, it's what I was, right? You're, you're connected to something that feels extremely important, right? You know, um, if, you're the, if you're the guy at, at the, the TCP and there's an onrushing vehicle, the decision to fire upon that vehicle or not, right? It could be a suicide bomber who's going to kill your guys. It could be an Iraqi family who got spooked, right? And the difference is, is you dead versus you know, killing a bunch of civilians, uh, which you also don't want to do. That's a big difference, right? Um, so you're all trying to achieve something. The stakes are incredibly high. Um, you're with this group of, uh, group of people day in, day out. You know them. Uh, you move together as a unit. You're, you're extremely well trained, uh, usually. And then you come back and there's there's a million things that you're missing, right? But also, the, the stakes of civilian life somehow seem off, right? Including the stakes for things that are very important, right? So uh, coming back to, to build a, a, you know, a relationship again with your wife, right? The sort of small things that, that are the hard work of living, but where you know, the, it's not like we're going to die if we don't do this. Um, and so kind of recalibrating yourself to a different mindset and, and recapturing uh, some of what, you know, you have in the civilian world that you need. And then also if you get out, trying to find a place where you fit in and have a sense of meaning and purpose um, is just a difficult, slow process, right? I mean, I think kids coming out of college feel a sense of ennui, right? How much more so if, if you're coming back from Iraq? Interesting. Any? Actually, I was going to ask Phil about one of the ways I think you sort of express that in a couple of the, the early stories is by the story is told almost entirely through military jargon. You know, there's an, and, and, no, and it's a really powerful way. The, as a civilian reader, 
you have to sort of pick, you have to go slow, you have to work out what the acronyms stand for, and they're not the same acronyms in Vietnam literature, or they're not, you know, it's a different language, but that attempt to, that, that way of kind of keeping the story, sort of making the reader work for the story, is I think a way of kind of getting at that problem of communication, that there's just, you know, this is a different language, and that they have to, the soldiers coming home have to learn how to translate their experience literally as well as kind of emotionally and, and more, you know, and more deeply than that. Yeah. I think certainly we often talk about the senselessness of war and, and I was thinking about that, uh, your choice of uh, a protagonist, Nadifa, who's nine years old and doesn't have the historical, political, or cultural context to understand. Um, we all have those contexts and we don't understand uh, what war is or what's happening in war. What were some of your thoughts in, in, in creating that character? Well, as the war developed and it became less about fighting the dictatorship, it became one between clans. And someone like Dergo, the little girl who was raised in a refugee camp and is actually completely cut off from the clan system. She doesn't have a parent, a mother or a father, so she doesn't know which clan she belongs to. And in that, in that situation, the war is completely senseless to her. Um, for the others, you know, you killed someone who was related to me, so I'm going to kill someone who's related to you. And, you know, that's what it descended into. It descended into a kind of madness. And I think it was most clearly expressed through this child's own experience of it. And again, just because I, I know that, um, as distinct from our other two novelists, this was a, is a period of time that you were not around for, so mm. it's an historical period for you, and you were not living in Somalia. So again, I'm wondering your process in creating that character. Was well, I'm obsessed with street children, and she's mm. a street child in this book, and my father was a street child. Um, okay, my first that's... book, Black Mamba Boy, was actually on his, based on his own real-life experiences, and he was born into a nomadic family in the 1920s and lived on the streets of Aden in the 1930s and eventually became a child soldier during the Second World War for the Italian fascist army. So a lot of it actually is through him. That's he's had many experiences, so he's always like a database to go back to. Um, but with this particular girl as well, there's still plenty of st street children in Somali. I'm actually now from Somaliland because it's broken away. And you see them all the time. And I'm, I'm fascinated by them. I'm fascinated in how they raise themselves. You know, they do have a morality. They do have ethics. And I think that in the West now, we've delayed the end of childhood. So it doesn't really end until maybe your mid-20s. <laughs> I sometimes believe that. Um, while in Somalia, you're an adult. Well, particularly for these children, actually. Not for everyone. For these children, their adulthood starts at maybe seven, eight years old. Well, by that measure, many of the soldiers that served in Iraq and Afghanistan were child soldiers, mm. 18 and 19 and 20. Yeah. Um, I think uh, maybe at this juncture, we'll turn to the audience for some questions for our panelists. If you have a question, it would be best if you could step to the microphone to ask. Hello, good evening. I just, uh, I just want to thank all of you guys for uh, the panel tonight. I really uh, appreciate a lot of what you're saying. My name is Alex Miller, and when I was in the Navy uh, chasing pirates off the coast of Somalia for liberty, I was wounded. And um, the Navy conveniently omitted that fact and I don't know if it was because uh, somebody got tired of writing or because they were embarrassed. But needless to say, I have a permanent fuck you in my back pocket for the government. Um, my question to you guys, all of you, is, is this. So including World War II, is it ever safe to say that war is necessary? There's a big one. Uh, 
My own sense is that war is necessary not because of the territorial imperative, which I can certainly live without, but because human nature just keeps on making the same gesture over and over. It's usually after Genghis Khan, okay, did fight his own battles, but you know, most of our generals are not out there in the front of their troops. Um, it's mostly war is declared by people who won't fight it. Um, and it's, it's fought for lots of reasons, and, and they aren't there on the battlefield. So it seems as though it's an impulse that just keeps on repeating itself. I mean, what, after World War I, it, people said, this is the last war we'll ever fight. This is so terrible. It's so clear. We've borne witness to it. It's an inhumane, it's an inhumane um, endeavor, and it will never happen again. And it happened again within eight years. So I don't know. I don't see how we can keep humans from having that impulse, sadly. What do you guys think? It's a question I ask myself a lot, actually. It's, it's an important discussion amongst Somalis because um, on YouTube, actually, um, there are lots of videos um, being uploaded that are very nostalgic about the dictatorship because it was the last time that at least southern Somalia had what looked like a, a real state. You know, you had traffic lights, you had people going about their ordinary business. So people are very nostalgic for that and they think that the war was the, was the kind of accident that caused all of that to disappear. While I don't really believe that, I think that the way that the dictatorship was, war was inevitable. They abused people's rights to such an extent and they were so um, immovable that there was only really one way of getting rid of them, but it caused immense suffering. I, I guess I'd go back to the classics again and just say, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a huge question and I also think one of the problems is that the stakes, it, it goes back to what we were talking about, the stakes of war and what... Um, uh, the experience of being in a, in a world of heightened stakes is just, if you've been there, it's impossible to, civilian life just doesn't, have, doesn't offer stakes or seems not to offer stakes that are the same. Um, the Iliad is full of instances where there's a guy kneeling uh, with a, a guy brandishing the spear above him and he's on his knees and he's saying, I'm the son of this landowner, I can give you, you'll have so much money, you can go to my father, you can have his land, you can have you know, and there's no, none of these bribes ever work. There's no point at which anyone is spared because they're rich or because they're, you know, and there's no logic to it. It's because once the spear is raised, it has to go into the, into the soldier. It just doesn't have anywhere else to go. And it's, it's sort of a, he plays that scene out over and over again, so is always making you think about what this is worth. But it's not, you know, the richest, the, the, you know, the richest land, part of the land, is never going to compensate for like that inevitable end. I don't know if that's a, an answer, but it seems to be a, an impulse. I'm, I mean, I'm no pacifist, but I think that if we, you know, we, I think if we, when we talk about war, it's very important to talk about it with a sort of cold, an honest eye, right? I mean, you know, you look back at World War II, I think it's very easy to forget how horrific that war was, how horrifically we behaved during that war, right? Um, which is sort of what happens when you initiate the industrial scale slaughter of human beings, right? Um, sure, war we should have engaged in, right? Some wars are better than others in that regard. Um, and sure, some are necessary, but you know, if we're gonna engage in them, I think we need to have a very clear sense of purpose, a very clear sense of the stakes, and a very clear sense of, of the kind of horror that you unleash when you do it. Um, you know, right now we're switching from you know, a model of kind of counterinsurgency uh, to counterterrorism, which is just us kind of killing people and, and hoping that solves the problem somehow. Uh, and You know, I worry that it's very easy for us to continue doing that without, uh, without a lot of sort of oversight and, and, and a lot of sense of, you know, what are the goals that we're trying to achieve on the ground? Because if we're gonna, if we're gonna kill people, we should have a really good reason and, and some sort of hope of some way, way forward. Thank you. All good answers. Um, 
I think you should just speak into the mic and speak loudly. I'm not sure if it's on. Um, thank you for that. My question is, when does the war end? Or certain wars? When do they begin? And how have you dealt with that in your future? That is a very large question. <laughs> Maybe if you could consider it just within the scope of how it pertains to your writing and your, the work on these particular books. I think I, I saw it as an incremental thing. I think that Somalia in the 1980s was, um, it wasn't officially at war till 1988, but there was such a level of violence, everyday violence, um, executions and uh, massacres, that it was at war. Um, from probably 1982 onwards, I'd say. And I wanted to show that, I wanted how, to show how people get used to violence. And the day when you actually can't stay anymore is um, the day when there's a tank aimed at your house. <laughs> That's when you have to leave. And um, the day that that, hap that happened, 90% um, of the people in my home city fled it was being, because it was being bombarded and um, mortared and it just became, life became unsustainable. But I think if life is sustainable, people will hold on. They'll ignore it as much as they can. Some other thoughts? For, for me, when I, um, I mean, we all know technically when the war in Iraq started, it was the spring of 2003, but um, if, as a civilian, I wasn't, uh, I had never been in favor of it. I didn't vote for George Bush, but uh, since we're in a situation in which you're largely helpless, you, 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 can't, you can't really influence that decision too much. So I was letting it just slide over my head, trying not to think about it because it, we were in it and I couldn't do anything about it. And for me, the, uh, the big change took place when I saw an article in the New York Times on the front page one day, and I don't know when it was because at the time it didn't strike me. I mean, I didn't know how important it was going to be. Um, and it was about what it was like for the troops on the ground, and they were being sent out in unarmored Humvees, driving over um, roads that were studded with IEDs. They were being blown up, and they were not being um, diagnosed as uh, having brain injuries because it was too expensive to treat them, and because it meant removing combatants from the field. So those three things I found horrifying, and that I couldn't get that out of my head, that we as Americans, um, when we were supposed to be the greatest military power in the world, I thought at least, even if we were in somewhere where we shouldn't be, in a war we shouldn't have gotten into, at least we would send people over with the best possible um, equipment, and we would take care of them if something went wrong, and none of those things were true. So that was the moment when, for me, that war started, and it filled my mind, and I started doing the work on the book. Do you think there's a sense here that, um, I know when the UK was at war with Iraq, um, that it's on, when it's on TV, that's when we're at war. That's how it sometimes feels, when you have the full specials and I, the ITN correspondent is there in Baghdad or wherever, that's when we're at war. And when they come home and start reporting about different things, well, the war's kind of over now. Is there a sense of that here? I don't watch TV much, so I, I, that, that also went right over well, my head. With, without a doubt, in Iraq, the, the killing of the four contractors, because there was video yeah. from that. I mean, the, yes, whereas uh, it seems like a lot of the other incidents in the war were not so televisable, like a random explosion on a roadside. That seemed to be a catalytic moment mm -hmm. that brought a lot of attention. Yeah. Or like. Um, was it Jose Rodriguez ordering the destruction of the CIA's interrogation tapes? Um, he said whatever blowback that we get from erasing them will be less than if, if anybody ever sees these, right? Yeah. Do we have, we have two more questions on either side. Can you hear me? Um, I was just curious, I'm just pulling it in a full circle back to the very beginning of the conversation about war literature being somehow on one side of everything else. It's this kind of special category. It's a bearing witness and in very large part 
written by people who have been involved in it, who have a special kind of past to say, I was there, I saw it, you didn't, I'm bringing back this special experience of it. In the sense that it's now becoming much more accessible to everybody in terms of cell phones and global communications and whatever. I was very struck a few weeks ago um, watching Central African Republic um, descend into a civil war where there was, a, there was um, essentially a beheading. Um, but there was a picture that what struck me was not that in particular because it's been going on for some time. It's that in the, in the Reuters stock shot of this happening, behind the person, there were a row of people, of local people, um, all with cell phones taking pictures of it. So that, you know, the sense that our, our young men, as it used to be exclusively men, going away and coming back saying, we have been in the jaws of hell and we're now, you know, a, a certain number of us will tell you civilians what it's like. You cannot imagine what we've been through, et cetera, et cetera that that's breaking down. In a sense, all wars will be more like civil war. They'll be more like Somalia. Or they'll be more like things where, where the delineation already, even in the wars that we're fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, we're fighting in Iraq, um, you, you know, the distinction between military um, and non-military is kind of all but gone. And in that sense, I wonder whether that whether that wall, if you like, between war literature and the rest is, no, is quite as impermeable as it might have been in the past. Well, yeah, and I mean, that, that barrier is only possible in a couple countries in the 20th century, right? Um, you know, it's, it certainly wouldn't have been possible for, um, you know, South Carolinians in the path of Sherman's army. Um, certainly wouldn't have been possible for uh, the Dutch in, you know, or God, for the Brits during the Blitz, right? Um, you know, if you read, you know, it's like World War One literature for the Brits, certainly you can, that's, that's a very clear tension because you have the, you know, home propaganda and then what they're experiencing. Uh, and then, of course, you know, for America in World War II and, and Vietnam, you have that division as well. Um, it's interesting the role of the role of media, right? And that's that's relationship to um, to the way that we experience the wars and the way that we think about them, right? Um, and the way that those things are framed. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think that I th hopefully that 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 firm distinction, hopefully we invite more, more voices into the room to kind of uh, challenge those old notions and, and, and tell new stories. And it's also interesting, actually. I, I do believe that some accounts, especially non-fiction accounts, um, are privileged according to your role in the war. So a book by a general will have more legitimacy than a book by someone who was, you know, um, a, a victim of whatever conflict. But I'm also wondering as well how wars are now almost made for television. Um, there was something interesting that even in Hollywood, early Hollywood, um, a battle in Mexico was staged specifically for screening in the USA. And um, I think nowadays c attacks um, such as the Westgate attack in Kenya and also the uh, Mumbai attacks, they're staged for the media. And um, they, they're instantly on Twitter talking about, you know, what's going on and corresponding directly with the media. And that's a very disturbing development, that these, this is almost entertainment. And the people who are um, at the hands of um, whatever group are, are just props, props to be used. Well, this comes back to the, the piece in, in, in that Phil read about the possibility of the anti-war novel or anti-war film is that there's a reciprocity mm -hmm. here, isn't there? Because um, as has been pointed out, the warriors themselves imbibe war literature, war films, mm -hmm. and act out. Those, those become the modes of imagining oneself as a warrior yeah. or imagining what combat is. Um, we have one more question here. Stuart, just to put oh, I'm one. Sorry. Um, when I was studying um, the conflict in Liberia, um, the, lots of the child soldiers watched First Blood. And they started 
kind of acting out First Blood, um, and it was a huge influence on them. And, and strangely enough, that film and the film that followed it was hugely influence, influential on perceptions of Vietnam veterans in this country. Really? And, and the political reality. And of course, Ronald Reagan was at that time known as Ronbo for his rather strident posture vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And that's a so. shocky action film. <laughs> it's high art. Last question. Thank you for your participation here this evening. Um, I have read a number of um, war journals, soldiers' journals, and letters home. And in the World War I era, I just noticed this powerful momentum from a, a naive idealism, but, but a, a really enthusiastic idealism, to a sense of utter disillusionment. And in World War II, um, a sense perhaps of invincibility and emotion towards um, just mere struggle for survival as, as time ensues. And I'm just wondering if through the characters in your stories and, and novels, if you tackle this sense of utter futility. I don't know if there's a sense of utter futility. Um, I mean, it's interesting because you've got as many different perspectives on the wars as you, as you have people who have you know, been in them, right? Um, actually, there's a great memoir in letters by Adrian Bonnenberger uh, called Afghan Post. It was just recently out. Mac Gallagher wrote a book that's based on his blog. There were a lot of people blogging, military folks blogging throughout the war, a kind of modern update on the letter home. And I mean, I think the, percep the perceptions shift over time. You know, a lot of, uh, it was an all-volunteer military. Um, you know, a lot of the guys over there do feel a sense of bitter disillusionment, uh, or they felt very strongly about the cause. I know certainly for a lot of Iraq veterans, when um, Islamic State took back uh, Ramadi and Fallujah, it was a real uh, kind of gut check. Uh, and, and just sort of a, a horrific moment, uh, thinking about what that means for those people and also uh, what it meant for what we've done. But, you know, your relationship to the war, I don't think a lot of guys feel a sense of utter futility um, because the difference between a good job and a bad job in, in war is, is huge, right? Like, you could be in World War II and, you know, you're the greatest generation or whatever, but you could be a shitbag, right? You could be a great soldier. Uh, you know, you could be committing, there are plenty of war crimes in World War II, far, far more than in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, and so I don't think, most of the vets that I know don't feel a sense of utter futility, but they do feel a sense of, uh, it's complicated, but they very, I think we're still working through how we feel about the wars that we were a part of and how they were prosecuted, because there's no question that the, the end state, certainly for Iraq, was, was just a lot of death and horror for the Iraqi people and, and, a, and a state that is dysfunctional, uh, that has repercussions broader. You know, Syria is, is just one example. So I think we're still figuring it out. I'd also say that, um, to connect back to the question about mediation, that um, so diaries and letters are also mediated in some way. Um, the, and the World War I sort of narrative of um, sort of idealism to disillusionment was being kind of presented to the soldiers in that way. I mean, that the, everybody went off to war um, reciting Rupert Brooke or whatever. And, that this idea, and this was everywhere in the papers. And the, the papers were full of this kind of uh, patriotic um, poetry. And, but that, that continues longer than we think it does, and it sort of it remains important for a volunteer military that there is this sort of idealism, and I think people are, there, there isn't sort of a, a point where people necessarily get disillusioned, although we sort of, in retrospect, see it as that point, and, and World War I does sort of get understood as this, as, from, from Rupert Brooke, and then we go to Wilfred Owen, who, uh, who saw it as it really was. But I think they, you know, they were, these things were coexisting, um, and there is still, uh, you can be disillusioned and also optimistic or believe in the larger 
goal and, and feel that this local situation you're in is terrible, I think that there's, as you were saying, you know, there's a, just a complexity to those responses that looks like a narrative in retrospect, but it's, we are the ones imposing that narrative on the, are you, on, on those documents, um, not so much that they, they sort of have them um, sort of automatically. Yeah, I would also just say, I mean, I agree with both what Phil and Joanna said, but um, I, so there's a huge range of experience, and some people come back feeling that they had a good war, they were in a place where there were whatever, whatever, whatever their missions were, they were able to accomplish them, even if they weren't, uh, even if the larger sense of the war seemed futile, but they were doing the work that they'd been asked to do. Some people uh, that I talked to were doing things like helping schools rebuild themselves or setting up a water system in a place that didn't have any water. So there were people who were doing work that was good. It, there's also, as, as well as people who ended up shooting civilians and feeling terrible about themselves. Um, there, I think there's also a, a difference in my own experience between enlisted men and officers. That the enlisted men that I talked to felt much more helpless, felt a sense of futility that I didn't see so much in the officers. Um, the officers had more agency, were able to um, control the situation more so that um, there was that there was that difference. But at one point, I, I kept being reminded not to make any assumptions myself. And at one point, I was talking to an officer, and uh, he was in the Marines. And I said, so when we talked about you know all sorts of things, and I said, so how did you feel the day that you learned that there were no weapons of mass destruction? There never had been. We never thought there were. And all of this was bullshit. And I, so did you feel a little betrayed by your commander in chief? And I would thought he, you know, he might find that very troubling and not want to really talk about it. He said, Roxana, there comes a life, there comes a moment in a young man's life when he wants to go to war. So there is this huge range. There are people who didn't want to go. There are people who did go, who wanted to go. There are people who had terrible experiences, people who did their job and came home and feel pretty good about it. So I don't think we can... We can generalize. Um, we can feel that the war was futile, but people did things there that they felt needed to be done, and it's just this huge range that's it, it's impossible to generalize about. I think, and it's really important that we hear that range of voices. I mean, I think that's that's the real thing is that we don't fall into the trap of mythologizing certain wars in a certain way and making. Uh, one particular narrative, one particular perspective, the dominant perspective, but that we listen to those other voices and those other points of view and, and get a larger sense of what, what war means um, in literary terms and in general, I guess. Well, that's certainly the value of novels and fiction, to go deeper into the subject, certainly deeper than CNN can. Um, I think we're going to, I, we really need to wrap up, I'm afraid. Um, let me encourage you to take your copies of Book Forum, take out the blow cards and subscribe because our next issue focuses, it's a war themed issue, it includes an essay by William Volman that addresses uh, Phil's collection of stories redeployment and it also includes uh, a short piece by Roxana. Uh, so that, visit the pen table. Uh, Get the schedule for other PEN events. Visit other PEN events in the World Voices Festival. Find out more information about joining uh, PEN's mailing list. And finally, head over to the table in the back where these authors' books can be purchased. Purchase their books. Have them sign them. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank Phil Cly, Joanna Scutts, uh, Nadifa Mohammed and Roxana Robinson. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and good evening.